We're going to get started again, everyone. So everyone who's outside, uh, thank you so much for those of you who have hung in here till the very end. Um, I think it's kind of interesting when Tracy called me to um, ask if I'd be a part of the planning committee. Um, some of, what, what she said that this workshop was going to do was try to determine and understand the evidence-based uh, practice of telehealth. Uh, do we know anything about outcomes? Um, where, where's the best place for telehealth in the Affordable Care Act? Um, what are the research questions that the IOM can help to answer? And I think just in the planning as well as what we've seen over the last two days, we've come a long way from that original goal. Um, I, you know, people have disclosed things, and I guess I have nothing to disclose. I kind of wish I did because I think there's probably money associated with that somehow. Um, and then I realized in speaking um, with uh, David at lunch today that I guess I am a proponent of disclosure. Um, I, when I remodeled uh, an old farmhouse, I put all clear glass doors on the bathrooms and the bedrooms because, of course, I live by myself. So I think that's going to let a light of air, light of, lot of air and light go through. And until I had my first house guests, I thought that was kind of weird because they couldn't shut the door and be behind a closed door. Um, when we put this session together, uh, we talked about really taking a look at could we bring a variety of stakeholders together um, to discuss actions that HHS had under or could undertake to further the use of telehealth to improve healthcare outcomes and uh, while controlling costs in the current healthcare environment. I think one of the things, and maybe for the next one of these we do, hint, hint, Tracy, um, is that we we made it probably made a little error or omission that we didn't have any consumers except for us. Um, we probably could use a consumer panel. We got the next best thing, which were, were um, our panel today, who really represents uh, um, the majority of rural stakeholders and other stakeholders that access their care through um, what I call uh, telehealth technologies and in the virtual space. Um, so I'm going to introduce our panelists. Uh, Dr. Benjamin is, uh, has been the executive director of the American Public Health Association, the nation's oldest and largest organization of public health professionals since December of 2002. And prior to that, he was the secretary of the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. So I imagine a lot of your preliminary work ended up uh, with some of the things we saw today from Maryland. Uh, Stuart Ferguson, you've heard from uh, through a lot of questions, is the CIO for the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, Consortium excuse me, located in Anchorage, Alaska, and has primary responsibility for all IT and informatics operations for the Alaska Native Medical Center, which is the largest native uh, hospital and medical system, uh, center in the United States. And Ellen Morgan, uh, we have just were reconnecting after years and years of not seeing each other, serves as the Chief Executive Officer for the National Rural Health Association. He has more than 22 years' experience in health policy development at the state and federal level. Uh, so, Dr. Uh, Allen, I think you're first. Well, thank you very much, Nina, for that introduction, and good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the National Rural Health Association, it is indeed my honor to be here today at the Institute of Medicine to talk about uh, the role of telehealth in the evolving healthcare environment. Uh, I'll follow up on Nina's suggestion, and I will disclose something as well. Uh, we are asked within a 10-minute period for each of us to talk about the current challenges facing telehealth and provide the all possible solutions during that 10 minute period as well too. <laughs> Don't laugh, I think I can accomplish that today. Let me start by, by highlighting what we do in rule, which is take innovative approaches to move healthcare forward. And as such, for everyone that's currently here today in the audience, I'd encourage you to pull out your smartphone, open up your browser, and Google rural health. For those of you that are online with us, you can simply just open up a separate browser. Google Rural Health. The first thing that always comes up is the National Rural Health Association's website. And on that website, under the tab listed as blog, you can easily pull up our 11-page full testimony, including the state of telehealth in rural America, 
and all possible solutions from a policy standpoint as well, too. This is a wonderful tool in the document, certainly for the IOM, the committee, and staff as you go forward to try to develop your recommendations. This document was developed by leaders in telemedicine and in, in telehealth in rural America from across the country, many of which are here in the audience today as well, too. And I would encourage the committee and the staff to simply cut and paste as liberally as you deem appropriate as you pull your comments together. As you know, we're here to help. Now, see, that was all within two minutes. So for the remainder of my eight minutes, what I think I'll do is just highlight some of the key policy recommendations that we would like to put forward. Now, unfortunately, these are not new or novel recommendations. They are going to be the same recommendations that you all have heard frequently inculcated and forcefully recommended over the last two days during this session, which is a good thing because it clearly demonstrates that there is coalescing among the telehealth community on what needs to be done to further expand telemedicine and telehealth. So as such, we have actually um, put these policy recommendations together into four policy buckets, which are reimbursement, credentialing, broadband and infrastructure, and finally research. I don't know how that matches the buckets that you have put mentally in your head to date over the past two days, but that's how we have uh, put them together. In the area of reimbursement, NRHA recommends, as many of you have already done at this meeting, that first we lift the geographic patient requirements of receiving care through telemedicine and telehealth. Now, it's very, very important as we proceed with this that we don't lose sight of the rule designations in ensuring that rule is served. But rural providers, rural providers are reimbursed less than their urban counterparts. And if the financial equation for the urban-based originating site does not work, as we have heard so often mentioned during the last two days, telemedicine will remain as a fringe service. Two, eliminate separate billing procedures for telehealth services. Telemedicine is a tool for the clinician. A separate CPT code does not make any sense. Third, reimburse care provided for by physical therapist, respiratory therapist, speech therapist, and social workers. These are services that are provided in high demand in rural areas, but are often not available to rural communities. Finally, provide reimbursement for store and forward applications. Now, Nita mentioned that I've been involved in health policy for 22 years. 21 years ago, I was a healthcare staff, staffer on Capitol Hill, and the CEO of the Kansas Hospital Association came in to talk about a novel payment methodology, the REACH Each program, the precursor for the Critical Access Hospital program. And at that time, 21 years ago, he said, Alan, let me be honest with you. Five years from now, we're not going to be talking about these hospital reimbursement issues because telemedicine is going to address all of our workforce concerns and quality and access concerns. 21 years ago. Now, I'm optimistic and I firmly believe that 21 years from now, we will not be alluding to the comments that I had right now. And that is because, obviously, we are in the perfect storm of health care right now, where if we are going to proceed with implementing the Affordable Care Act and the expansion of care, if we're going to address current workforce shortages in rural America, address quality, and address health disparities, we have no option for it other than the utilization of telehealth as a tool for the clinician. So that's my optimistic pitch that I'm not going to be here 21 years ago mentioning my comments. The second bucket, credentialing. We've had a lot of discussions about that over the last two days. The IOM should study the cost effective, uh, a cost affiliated with credentialing and privileging as it is very burdensome to rural providers. This is a foolish barrier. A telehealth provider can administer healthcare services to patients anywhere in the country. The NRHA recommends that CMS adopt a policy to allow telehealth providers to receive deemed status and to allow for healthcare facilities receiving uh, telehealth services to perform credentialing by proxy. Again, this is not a new recommendation. You have heard that repeated by many of the speakers over the last two days. On the topic of broadband and infrastructure, 
This is an easy recommendation going forward because investment in broadband will require a combined will and collaboration of both the private industry and government regulators. The IOM should make this as a priority recommendation. This ties back to the FCC comments that we had during yesterday morning. Finally, in the issue of data and outcomes research, number one, as you have heard many times, there is much research already available. But I'm going to differ a little bit from some of the earlier comments of yesterday morning. And on behalf of the National Rural Health Association, call for additional quality measures in telehealth treatments to improve the services in rural America. Now, let me be careful on this. And as the IOM considers this, uh, I hope you won't fall into the uh, trap of assuming that just because healthcare is delivered in rural America, therefore it must be of a lower quality. That is not the case, and that is not the case highlighted by the IOM's report, Quality Through Collaboration, and also looking at CMS's own hospital compared data, comparing small critical access hospitals that have reported through hospital compare versus their urban counterparts. Those two sources clearly indicate that rural uh, health care, when delivered as they do in rural America, compared with urban communities, is comparable and, in fact, sometimes better quality. What we're talking about this is directly to what Jeff Stinsland, Dr. Stinsland, talked about during his presentation with MedPAC, and that is, for some specialized care, it might make sense to take a look at that more in depth to see whether the quality has actually improved. I think that that's a great research potential going ahead and will help make the case for the need of the expansion into rural communities. NRHA also calls for research to aid the telehealth resource centers, TRCs, and regional extension centers, RECs, the RECs, to improve the services they provide. Now, very, very important, NRHA does not think that these two entities are not doing their job. They are doing their job. But without the research, the outcomes research of how their assistance is providing and successfully providing assistance to rural communities, they cannot amend, correct, and move forward in providing that technical expertise to rural providers and rural communities. Let me close my comments with something that Dr. Mary Wakefield commented on in her opening remarks. And NRHA would call for the um, study and look at the effect of telehealth has on recruiting clinicians and training clinicians. Because telehealth not only addresses the direct clinical uh, application, but also, as Dr. Wakefield indicated, can help address these workforce challenges that we often face. I see my light is on. So let me go ahead and conclude with a realization that we all know, and that is truth can set you free. And the truth has, has, that has been indicated and articulated over the last two days here is that it is time to set telemedicine free. The barrier is no longer, longer the technology as it was 20 years ago. The barrier now remains in the rules regulations and guidelines that we, we have opposed, imposed upon it. So I, on behalf of the National Rural Health Association, I want to thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony to the IOM as they look at this topic. And again, remind you all to go online, type in the words rural health. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be here. Thank you to the Institute of Medicine and the National Academy of Sciences and to the organizers of this conference for the chance to talk. Uh, I'm Stuart Ferguson. I'm, I'm, it's my privilege and honor for this uh, year to be the president of the American Telemedicine Association. I'm going to talk a little bit about the association and I think where the association fits into this kind of jigsaw puzzle of, of telehealth. Um, all of us that do telehealth typically start locally and build to regional, national, and international efforts. So I thought I'd present my talk a little bit that way and give you a little bit of a sense of where I come from and my perspective on telehealth. 
Um, I was the director of a program in Alaska. It continues to this day, even though my role has changed. They're going to probably do about 50,000 cases this year. Last year, um, the account at telehealth was used in about 3% of all outpatient encounters on the tribal health system. About 16% of our native population had a telehealth case done. Um, and this does not include telerad, telefarm, video conferencing, um, or home telehealth remote patient monitoring. When we add all those numbers together, it gets kind of silly big. We really use telehealth in Alaska. And, and I think it's kind of interesting. We've all had challenges. We've all been trying to kind of push this string uphill or push start this bus to try to make telehealth happen in our remote re in our own regions. And I think by a lot of measures, we would consider ourselves successful in Alaska. Um, and when we talk about the challenges, as we've been doing uh, throughout the last two days, sometimes it's hard to understand what success would look like. And let me give you a couple of senses of what success feels like, um, but why those still aren't, those are still challenges. I was going down to Juneau um, some months ago to speak to our state legislature, and when I landed in Juneau before I even left the airport, two different individuals told me that I better be prepared because the Commissioner for Health and Social Services and the state Medicaid director had testified that day to our legislature that they are counting on telemedicine to save as much as $30 million in travel costs this year. So our state counts on telehealth as a way to decrease the cost of care. Um, our, our commissioner and our state Medicaid director openly and privately look at us as partners and are asking us to come up with incentive plans and different methodologies for payments that will incentivize the use of telemedicine and decrease at, uh, cost of care. Um, my hospital administrator meets with me about every month and he asks me what more can I do and his business plan each year has additional telehealth activities in it. This year it's EICU. We're expanding remote patient monitoring. Our hospital advocates and embraces this as part of their strategy and their business plan. Our tribal partners have policies that mandate the use of telehealth. Next Friday I have to meet with over 60 tribes and, and talk to them about what we are doing to meet their demand for increased specialty access through telehealth. So when it starts to take off and this bus catch or this engine catches fire and it's running, you have different challenges. And the challenges are trying to scale your system and to meet the demand. And it's a good challenge, but it's probably the challenge we'll be talking about in a year or two once some of the other challenges go away. And I'd like to say this is where I think the ATA has a role. The ATA with a 17-member board and a staff are consciously trying to look ahead and prepare to meet the demand that's going to be there in 12 to 24 months. This is the vision of the American Telemedicine Association, that this will be a fully integrated system in healthcare. That's the vision we have in Alaska. It's probably the vision that many of you have within your own telehealth systems. And so I look at the ATA as a telehealth director in Alaska as a partner in this journey because they can provide some services that I cannot achieve on my own in my own system. So what is the role of the American Telemedicine Association? Those of you that are familiar with it are probably familiar somewhat with uh, the, the official journal of the ATA, and Chuck Dorn, one of the, the editors-in-chiefs, is in, is in the uh, audience here. They, do a, they have a lot of online resources available through their website. They continue to do webinars and, web, and webcasts. Um, they're involved in social media, and you can connect with them through Facebook and other different methodologies. And they have member participation, like all good associations. But, but let me talk a little bit about some of the activities that are specific that I think you might want to know more about. They do annual meetings. The annual meeting, the biggest, uh, the annual meeting that they have in the spring is the largest meeting of its kind anywhere in the world devoted specifically to telehealth, telemedicine. And it's kind of a, a, con a convening meeting of folks that provide services, manufacturers a device, educational and academic programs, the best evidence that's out there for the field. And the, the meeting is actually focused on trying to get the best of breed, the best of evidence, the best financial models, and bring those people together and have a good session. That happens usually in April or May. There are fall meetings and other meetings that they do as well. So they are a major convener, convener of folks involved in telemedicine. What I'd like to talk today is, is something else that they do, and I think it's extremely important to, the, to this field as it moves forward, and that is the active participation of their members. They actually involve members through several different mechanisms, and one of them is the member groups. And within ATA, they have very specific, what they call SIGs, special interest groups, such as business and finance, remote monitoring, and many of you in the audience probably participate in one or more of these. These are 
somewhat subject matter expert interest groups, and they do webinars, they do meetings, and they actually get involved in evidence-based guidelines and practices, and I'll talk about that in a few, minute, a few minutes. They have chapters, we have discussion groups, and then because we're an interesting association where we actually also involve the industry, we have an industry council that has a voice in the association, but we also have institutions that provide health care, and they have an institutional council that represents those, and Joe Tracy, who was here earlier today, is the head of the institutional council. So in terms of these member groups, they're very, very important to what we do, and they kind of are helping drive this um, association in the field of telehealth forward. They develop practice guidelines, they do some advocacy training, and they're involved in peer review functions. This has been presented earlier. Um, I saw Elizabeth Kropinski refer to it, and I believe um, Nina referred to it earlier as well. The ATA is heavily involved in developing evidence-based practices, practice guidelines, and standards. This is really, really important. One of the challenges, going back to the beginning of my talk, is how do I adopt new telehealth programs when my hospital administrator decides he wants to do EICU, or we want to expand remote patient monitoring? We really want to follow, follow best practices. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We don't want to try to discover this on our own. So the source for that information, I think it's really the only source that's out there right now, is to go to the ATA to look at what standards and guidelines have been developed. And they've been developed with the involvement of academics, industry, practitioners, providers, and so forth. They have a series of guidelines that have been completed, and they have a number of them in progress. And I highlighted a few here in yellow because they've, they've been mentioned, I think, throughout the talk here. Nina specifically is heading up the Remote Health Monitoring and Data Management Group. In fact, she just expanded her group by inviting some of the, the earlier speakers to that group. Um, just to give you an idea of kind of who participates in these, these are the, the working group members in the tele-ICU. And tele-ICU, uh, we heard the other day about 8% of all ICU beds are covered with tele-ICU, but we don't have a formal guideline that tells us how to do this and what's the best practice, and this group is going to try to put that together. You have a blend of academics, providers, ICU um, service heads, and uh, some of the the vendors in this group. So it's a fairly nice group to work with. The reason that we need guidelines, the reason we need standards, is not just to do it right, but because telehealth really is a solution of scale. I can tell you it makes no sense to do telehealth for 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 patients. It makes sense when you start to get into the hundreds because the investment and the change in the care delivery system is just too difficult to do for too few patients. But I can also tell you that as soon as you start to get into scale, and if you have a department, as we have, that went from 40 to 400 to 4,000 consults a year through telehealth with only eight physicians, the problems change. The challenges change. And I think if we look a year to two years ahead and we realize we're on an exponential adoption curve, we're going to be facing a different set of challenges, and they're going to be challenges of scale. Adam Darkins has already solved some of these in the VA, standardized training, standardized methodology, centralized support. These are going to be the challenges we face, and people already talked about doing it in chronic care or home telehealth remote patient monitoring. So I would guess in about a year or two, those will be the conversations, and ATA wants to play a role in some of those conversations. The ATA also accredits telemedicine programs. We have five so far. These are probably the best of breed training programs that we recognize that follow very rigorous methodologies and seem to do a very, very good job. We just came from a two-day board meeting this week, and we've developed our strategic, strategic plan for the coming year. And just to give you a sense of some of the key areas in that, we're going to continue to work on public policy. You heard Gary Capistrand talk about that the other day. We're, going to, we're actually going to start to, to develop and distribute the evidence base studies for telehealth, what we think are the, the right studies for us to be looking at. We're going to drive the adoption of best practices through these standards and guidelines. <coughs> we're going to start to work with our training programs and comprehensive educational systems and we're going to continue to work with consumers so that they're aware that this thing called telehealth exists for their needs. I'll finish with this. Um, it is the American Telemedicine Association. It's more than telemedicine, and it's more than American. More than 10% of the members are international, and, so the, so, and that's actually good because telehealth and healthcare is now well beyond the bounds of our country, and the ATA is working very aggressively to make sure that 
the lessons learned in our country are shared and the lessons learned in other countries are also shared back here. And that's the goal of ATA is to bring people together and to move this field forward. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to um, just uh, take a little different tact on this, just remind you that obviously those of us in public health, we certainly have patients, um, but we, we kind of look at the, the world a little differently from a population-based perspective. And often it's not uh, only patients, but it's the population at large. Um, and, and just like the healthcare system, um, there are many drivers that are driving the population health systems change. And, um, these are just some of them. I just want to point out a couple. Obviously, there's a, a lot of data floating around, um, and public health lives off of data. Um, the enhanced capacity to link and analyze large data sets is, is really transforming the way we think about the world. Um, the speed in which the technology is changing, uh, as it is in the rest of the uh, telehealth world. Um, the requirement to better integrate primary care and public health. Um, because we just think there's an enormous potential that's been lost uh, in prevention and early intervention that we're not taking uh, um, the benefit of. Uh, and, of course, the, the fact that um, a lot of the systems change is going to be really driven um, by the millennials um, and, and maybe us jealous baby boomers who are trying to catch up with our kids um, because they, they are very comfortable using the technology, um, although many of us may not be as comfortable. Um, when they rolled out Healthy People 2020 this year, um, it, in, it did include a, a goal for health information technology. Uh, it had a series of objectives. Um, I just point out the one around support shared decision making between patients and providers. I, I think that what the, the E um, and telehealth movement does is fundamentally change relationship from us clinicians that know it all um, where we blessed our patients with our knowledge and wisdom, um, to really a informed bilateral conversation uh, with our patients to try to help them improve their health. And I think it fundamentally changes the relationship, and we need to recognize that as we go forward. Uh, secondly, the fact that we want to deliver reliable and actionable information to people. Um, as someone said earlier, there's lots of information on the web. There's lots of information floating around in, in, in cyberspace. A lot of it is, is factually inaccurate. Um, um, one of our challenges as public health folks is to try to uh, work with others and make sure that that information is reliable. Um, among some of their other objectives, um, the idea of trying to connect to hard-to-reach populations that are culturally diverse um, also remains a big challenge. Um, and, and really trying to build some sound principles in the design of these programs and interventions um, that result in, at the end of the day, health or behaviors, um, we think is one of the big challenges. Uh, there is no question that telehealth brings enormous value, and the key word is enormous, um, to managing population health interventions. Um, and I'm, I'm going to talk about each of those um, very, very specifically. So this is the um, 10 essential services for public health and the three core functions. And uh, just remind people that public health basically is role in the world is to do assessments, um, and then to take what we learn from that to do policy development, and then through a variety of, of venues assure um, that those things get done that we feel are important. Um, and these are kind of the 10 essential services. I, I, I'm on a quest to remind everybody that as we move to an environment in which everybody has an insurance card, um, there are some who say, well, why do we still need a public health system? And I point out that of the 10 essential services, only one of them um, is clinical in nature. And it's also split between not just providing that care for those people that still do that within the public health system, but the key word is linking people um, to systems. In fact, public health does more linking uh, in most public health systems than they do in terms of providing care. Um, with that in mind, clearly um, telehealth is going to be very helpful as we look at uh, tracking disease and disease trends through such things as immunization and cancer registries. Um, as we um, investigate new disease outbreaks, we have an enormous number of new mechanisms to do disease surveillance, syndromic surveillance systems, where we're collecting data not just from the health system, um, but looking at um, what, what's being sold in pharmacies and what's being sold in grocery store shelves and putting all that data together 
with school absenteeism to, to try to early to do some early pickups on um, new disease processes um, based on clinical syndromes in communities. Um, a, a variety of ways of communicating effectively to stakeholders, um, including um, the Health Alert Network, for example, from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, which we've used in a variety of, of public health emergencies. Um, the idea of mobilizing community partnerships. Um, um, and I'm going to come back and talk about social media in just a moment, but primarily through um, linking people and engaging them through the, through the, um, through the web and other mechanisms, um, we can help mobilize community partnerships and move communities um, to actually take empowerment action towards their own health. Um, obviously, the, the whole issue of linking and coordinating care, we continue to talk about that 25% of the people that spend 75% of the dollars. Um, but the more interesting part, I think, of such a discussion is when you actually start overlaying who those patients are with the challenge communities and the social determinant problems that we have. So many of those communities, the same people that we're having that are challenged um, are the same places where there are food deserts, or the same places where there are high levels of lead in the, in the, in the environment. They're the same places um, where you um, um, have crime or violence, where uh, um, the streets have not been fixed, so they're not walkable or bikeable or green. Um, so when you're, when you're looking at in your clinical practice at those patients, you know, those, we used to call them noncompliant. But when we actually begin to ask them why they're quote unquote non-compliant, um, we find out that there are many things um, that are fundamentally outside their, their, their functional control because of their socioeconomic status. Um, that if we fix those from a community perspective, um, we'd be able to improve their health. So imagine a partnership between the medical community and the medical care community, um, the public health community and the medical care community, where we actually look at those folks as, as data points on a map uh, and then put in place um, strong community um, programs or interventions that actually make it easier for them um, to improve their health or try to reduce that number of quote unquote non-compliance that we have. Um, a whole range of activities around workforce training, you know, webinars like we're having today, um, video conferencing, um, um, interactive journals, um, so the journals don't just come to us. Um, as, as um, pieces on the paper, but there are videos and blogs and um, conversational tools that go along with that information to try to help improve skills uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, and then the fundamental research that happens um, um, for both health systems research and public health systems research, um, we think there's going to be very important tools as we go forward. Now, at the American Public Health Association, we've invested a lot in social media tools. We, um, we have discovered um, how effective they can be um, as, as we've um, moved forward in terms of our engagement of communities. Um, we actually have a, um, a tool which is called, called Flu Near You, where we're actually um, we're recruiting people to get a part of it, and they report on a weekly basis of how they're feeling. Um, and as this flu season develops, we're going to be looking to see if we actually can pick up by self-reported symptoms, um, whether flu is into a community or not. Um, and then, of course, if it does, then you can send out targeted authoritative information uh, to that listserv uh, about what to do in terms of enhancing uh, social distancing or hand washing or getting the vaccine or whatever the public health intervention may be uh, as you go forward. And this is a range of social media tools um, that are going to be effective as, as we look at this as we go forward. Of course, just like everything else, the challenge that we have is paying for health information technology. Um, obsolescence remains a problem. Um, before 9-11, the public health system was still operating off of rotary phones. Um, we've gotten rid of the rotary phones, but now we're still operating off of um, um, the wonderful new technology we got right after 9-11 for part of the emergency preparedness, um, none of the equipment which has been replaced. Um, so the, um, those of you who have kids in college know that college is now a two, maybe a three computer experience for most parents. Um, that's not the case for public health departments. They need the technology, but they don't necessarily have it. Um, continued questions about return on investment on prevention. Um, and the need, the fact that we need to have a much better planned investment um, in these systems. Um, so I, I leave us with three recommendations as I close. One, that we clearly need to make strategic investments in population-based uh, HIT and data systems that we 
um, should require appropriate linkages of the public health and health care data systems. Remind you that from, a, from the HIPAA perspective, public health is exempt from that. So those, those, that data can very well go into the public health systems um, with, of course, patient confidentiality and, and appropriate protections in place. Um, and then I think finally, we need to demand accountability for population-based outcomes from everybody. I mean, I'm, I, I remain impressed as, as a public health advocate uh, at the number of um, states, for example, in our ranking systems that remain at the bottom, um, and they've been at the bottom for some time, and yet if those were crime statistics or education statistics, um, everybody would be ducking for cover. But the fact that a health outcome remains at the bottom for 10, 15, 20 years, there doesn't seem to be the activism around um, trying to address that. I think that um, obviously telehealth will help us um, not only document those uh, medical outcomes better, um, but target solutions and find a target solution where we can make a difference. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of our speakers. I, I'm impressed, again, each one of these panels is very interesting. I know nobody talks to each other beforehand to kind of, you know, say, what are you talking about, what are you talking about, so we don't, uh, we don't uh, duplicate. But we never duplicate. It's amazing. And I think the consistent uh, message that we've heard is we have still have a need to document return on investment in health care in general, not so much you know, I, I'm, I'm moving very quickly away from this whole telehealth piece, but uh, doc, to document return on investment and the strategies we use in healthcare, care, um, to look at large and link large data sets, and to enhance the use of public policy through the efforts that, we, that we're trying to achieve, whether it's public health, private health, um, telehealth, whatever it is. So I open up to questions from the audience. Yes. Is that better? Yeah, All right. that's much better. So I have a question for Dr. Ferguson, and that's, um, so I've heard uh, a few times the last couple of days uh, a, a, a good statement about the focus can't be on technology. Absolutely true. Uh, but there is technology involved, and I guess I find myself wondering, why isn't there more focus on interoperability standards? I, I've heard that at least from at least one of the panels that those are issues, and it looks to me like that is, in fact, one of the major challenges we have. And, I'll, and, and a secondary piece to that, and this is really a, a, a sort of a what if, I find myself wondering, you know, everybody, it appears, who are doing this are building out their own support network. Is there an opportunity to build out a shared services uh, support network for multiple providers? So those are great questions. Um, so interoperability has really been a struggle from the beginning. It is a challenge. And, and it, it's now it got more magnified as we as we rely on EHRs and we have data that needs to get into the EHRs and so forth and so on. Um, interoperability oftentimes gets addressed through the, the standards and guidelines, um, things such as dermatology and some other areas, DICOM standards and Telerad. So it does get addressed at that level. We don't have separate um, activity focused on that within the ATA, but that's how we, we deal with it. Um, there, there are groups that are focused on interoperability, and I think we heard earlier about Continua and some other groups that are really trying to make sure that there is a standard for some of this device interactions, and a lot of that discussion happens through the industry council at the ATA, so that's another source for, for pieces on that. Um, you, actually, you asked about... Can I interrupt just for a second? Oh, yeah, so before you move on, um, so that's good to hear, but uh, you mentioned the industry council, and... Uh, for instance, uh, my university, we had, we were being pressed very hard, I should say marketed to very hard, by a local cable company and a national cellular provider uh, who have, you know, what looks to be really interesting, you know, home systems, but they're proprietary. They won't work with anything else. And I find myself wondering at this point, 
you know, why is that even a, an issue of discussion? Yeah, and, and you're specifically talking about patient monitoring devices? Right. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll, I'll say privately, as, as privately as I can do it in a public audience. <laughs> um, I, I think the time's long overdue to, to use things such as direct messaging or some other technologies which exist as standards to move that data. You know, a lot of vendors will sell you their devices that talk to their their proprietary server, but they can give you an HL7 feed either real time or, you know, kind of batch mode into your, into your EHR. Um, there have been some models that I've seen from companies that will do direct messaging and, and then it gives you some options to do a real-time feed. Um, so, so I don't know, you know, an ATA has not got a position on that, but, but I think it's a really good question. I, I can tell you I know of one um, very, very large telehealth system that actually is man have come up with their own middleware um, that talks to any other EHRs and are mandating all uh, providers start to talk to that middleware and, and so you can begin to see the, the, the cracks in that dam. And then your question about national um, support centers and, and, and issues like that, that's a really good question. There are, <clears throat> excuse me, there are actually some national support centers even for uh, remote patient monitoring. We actually use one in Michigan that provides support for our system, but I don't think it's really taken off at the level it could and I think this came up earlier, specific with chronic disease management, about the potential for this. I think Bonnie Britton brought it up. And, and I think those business models, I think, are very um, juvenile at this point, but I think you're going to see some changes there. And you've seen it happen with virtual, you know, with, with Telerad. It's happening, I think, with Tele-IC, and it's going to happen in other fields. I'm Paul Glassman. I'm from the University of Pacific School of Dentistry in San Francisco. I think I'm the only dentist here, although I can't speak for the web audience. But uh, I really appreciated the opportunity to be here, and it was interesting to see the variety of issues that have been brought up over the last couple of days. They all apply in the world of, of dental health. I just want to put a plug in for being inclusive and thinking about oral health when thinking about how to weave together all the various components of things that are happening in the world of, of telehealth. Um, I remember in, in Todd Nesbitt's uh, opening presentation, there was a picture of a six-foot tooth uh, up on the screen there yesterday. That tooth was, uh, was I took the picture of the uh, dental hygienist um, with a camera in that, in that young lady's mouth at a school in Sacramento. It's a school for low-income children. And in California, about 25% of children <coughs> have never had any dental care. That's all the way up through elementary school. In that particular school district, it's over 50%. So this is, uh, uh, I think that we have a huge uh, level of health disparities in oral health, far beyond the level of health disparities that are experienced in the general health care system. And I think that level of health disparities, of course, brings with it lots of opportunities to be able to reach people who are not taking advantage of their traditional oral health care system to be able to get dental care through the use of telehealth technologies. In California, this year, through the efforts of the California Center for Connected Health Policy, which you've heard about, there was a bill that one of the things it did was change the wording throughout California law and remove the word telemedicine and replace it with the word telehealth. And I would like to put a pitch out to this audience to be thinking about that. Sometimes words matter and terminology matters, and that kind of connotation of telehealth is a more inclusive way of thinking about things. Even the telehealth, uh, National Telemedicine Association, I'm sorry to pick on the Telemedicine Association, but uh, could think about that kind of, of, of being more inclusive. I, I put in an abstract yesterday to present at the next meeting. If you look at the drop-down list of the subject, there's about 35 diseases on there. Oral health isn't there. I couldn't find a way to, to <laughs> characterize the, the topic of the abstract that I wanted to put in. So um, I'll just leave you with that thought. I think that it's important as we begin to think about the use of these kind of systems and building out healthcare systems that are inclusive and connect people together to think about using wording and using uh, thinking in a way that links all these various aspects together. Thank you. Um, if I could make a comment on that. Um, we've had teledentistry at uh, Marshfield Clinic since 2005. We screen about 500 Head Start children, so they're three and four year old, some five year olds each year. Um, and we basically find 75 to 80 percent of them have active dental caries, and about 20 percent have two or more open pits. If you don't know what that is, it's, it's pretty scary. Um, 
I cannot name one other teledentistry program, <laughs> except maybe yours, um, that, uh, that does teledentistry. But we, what we found is about uh, six years ago, we started to actually put up rural dental clinics as a result of a tornado in one of our local communities that lost its only dental clinic. Uh, we supported that dentist to get his practice open again and then realized that there's a great partnership and a collaboration that occur that needs to occur between uh, our dental providers and our medical providers because oral health has a direct impact on the quality of life and quality of health that individuals have. Um, so, you know, we've, we've actually taken the model of telehealth. Um, one of the dentists came and said, you know, why, why can't we do this for dentistry? So it's something to think about. Um, telepathology, mobile retinal screening. We have so many different um, disciplines that are using telehealth now that it's not so much about medical practice or surgical practice, but dentistry and obviously the mental health we saw earlier. Stu? Yeah, I was going to say two things. One, this will be a real test of my presidency to see if we can add oral health to the drop-down list. So check back in a week. Um, uh, Satisfied with small victories, right? Yeah. You know, Alaska is one of those places with just um, real challenges with dentistry, lack of dentists, and a lot of dental challenges. So we've been doing teledentistry for, for many, many years. And we actually have now a program that's called the DHAD program, Dental Health Aid Training. And those are um, typically uh, folks from the villages that come in, get trained, and go back and are dental therapists. And we embrace, we actually do telehealth training in the telehealth training in the training program, and they actually use it for mentoring. So they actually take images and communicate with dentists that supervise them outside the state. And then when they go to the village, we use uh, telehealth all the time. So it's, it's a natural fit. We, we agree. And maybe I could just add, since you said you aren't aware of other teledentistry programs in the country, if people want to find out more about how it might work, in the California Dental Association Journal is a free download. The July issue was entirely devoted to the program that we're running and has five articles about the way we're doing it and the technology and the methodology. So that's a place you could get more information about how to, how to do a teledentistry project, which is, actually has nine demonstration sites across the state of California. Great. Thank you so much. Other questions? Um, I have a question for the panel. Um, as you all are um, large organizations, three very large stakeholder organizations, um, can you talk a little bit about, and hopefully you are, how you're working together to advance uh, public policy, quality, cost, return on investment, whatever, um, and thoughts on how we might all work together in the future with your organizations? Well, let me start and say, just as collaboration is important in telehealth and telemedicine as we go forward, and it's also important for our national organizations to partner going ahead as well. And um, I was just talking with Dr. Benjamin earlier. We partner with the APHA on uh, numerous issues, but we have not on the area of telehealth. So I look forward to doing that going forward. Um, the ATA, I, I, I want to say that uh, your staff and what we're talking, if not um, every week, at least every other week. So obviously, just by the nature of the, the health care delivery process in rural America, that has to be a strong partnership going ahead. But I think it's going to be incumbent on all of us to bring in other like organizations into this discussion as we move forward. Yeah, I would just, I would just concur with that. And I, I think uh, the health educators would be a good, uh, a good partner with this as well. Um, you know, what, what – um, one of the biggest challenge I think we're going to have is the amount of misinformation um, flowing through all of these electronic systems. Um, um, and we have enough problems when we're all saying the same thing and we're factual and people hear different things. Um, but then when you add the, the amount of misinformation on, on, and through our systems, um, we're, we're going to um, really be, we're going to need a lot of work to become the trusted advisors to the American people on this issue. Um, and that's going to be from the clinical side to the, the more population-based side. And, and um, I, I think that's one of the places that we really want to work, want to spend a lot of our time in, in trying to make sure that the information that goes out is accurate, um, um, that there's a rapid response when there's a bad piece of information there. And we're doing a lot of that, by the way, with vaccines. Uh, as you know, there's a, there's a large anti-vaccine movement out there, and we're spending a fair amount of time rapidly responding um, to to um, bad information about vaccines. 
specific to the ATA, uh, I've been on the board seven years, and, and every time we meet with the staff, it's a small staff, but, but they, they know they have to work uh, in collaboration and association with other organizations. So I know we work with uh, NRHA. They also, as you heard, work with Nobel Women. They work with um, the Million Hearts program. So they're working with a lot of different programs, including Parkinson's groups and other folks where there's patient populations that really could benefit through telehealth. So I know that's happening, Nina. Any other questions, comments? Hi, I'm Janice Brown, and I'm with the American Speech Language Hearing Association. And I'm also a co chair of a subcommittee of the American Telemedicine Association's um, Tele Rehab Group. And the, the uh, subcommittee is on licensure portability. And I bring this up because um, for the last couple of days, of course, one of the number one issues that keeps coming up as a challenge, of course, is the whole problem around licensure. And um, as a state policy person, it is a big deal. And when you mentioned uh, coalitions, um, this was a perfect opportunity. In our little um, subcommittee, we actually invited um, the PTOT and speech and hearing um, at, um, licensure boards to join in with us in our conversations around licensure portability. And one of the big things they keep saying is, why aren't we being asked to participate in all of these conversations about licensure portability on a national level. And I happen to know from the research, like National Governors Association, everyone that's been involved in trying to change the licensure problem that we have for telehealth to be able to progress uh, across state lines, um, they're not necessarily being involved. And they, you know, they take that as a an affront, and we know that it's a big obstacle, uh, and we need to have them involved. So I just want to put that out there as uh, something to consider, uh, bring them in, um, help start talking with them. That is what is said on a national basis on a lot of times, but nobody's doing it. Nobody's actually doing it. Um, so I think they want to be invited in, and I think there's some possibilities there. And then the other part of this is... Um, Sometimes it's not always the boards that are driving this, um, and I kind of look around here and wonder, where is the AMA on this? Um, we know that they've been a major obstacle, not necessarily the medical boards. They started out in the early days as trying to make a difference by trying to create special licenses, by trying to do things. But when it came down to it on a policy level, the AMA has not embraced this, and it makes it difficult for all the other groups. So I just wanted to put that out there, and I welcome your thoughts on that. I'll jump into that one. Um, so first off, thank you for serving on the groups with ATA. I appreciate that. As you probably know, Alan Cohen um, is, is, is on our board now and uh, very actively involved in this. The, the ATA um, is, is very much aware of the issues. I think probably the positions have been a little bit in terms of what position to take. There's the AMA, there's the Federation of State Medical Boards. There's, there's a lot that goes into this picture. And there's been some changes recently, such as the ability, uh, especially on the federal side with VA, DOD, IHS, to not, well, they have not necessarily all, always required a state license, but now their consultants don't have to have a, a license in the state to see they're providing care to a patient. So there have been some changes. There's talk at the national level, perhaps, of Medicare having a similar um, waiving of a requirement and, and so there, there are there is talk about some changes what I can tell you that happened at the ATA board is we are involved more Ellen is involved um, but the board actually took a position this year that they want ATA to be very actively involved in this and to actually push for change I think in the past it's been a little bit more passive and somebody invoked Winston Churchill's we will win in the air we will win in the land we are actually going to go after this pretty aggressively <laughs> Yeah, I think I think this will be driven actually by um, um, bigger bi business interests like in the integrated health systems um, and the accountable care organizations because they're going to cross state lines. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the consolidation of the of the industry I think will drive uh, a lot of that licensure issue um, because as you know the thing that the underlying concern of course is all about money, and um, um, I think that once you start bringing people in these larger systems, um, a lot of that will rapidly go away, at least within those systems. Um, and um, I, I would watch and see what happens in the Washington metropolitan region or the 
um, in, in Boston um, in particular as they, as they begin remodeling their systems because people are moving so rapidly across those um, various borders. Um, you, uh, just as uh, Wisconsin was one of the states that got a licensure portability grant out of ARRA a, a granting, and I can tell you that we had nine states, and seven of those states represented all of the licensed uh, clinicians in that state, so the licensed practitioners. I think at the state level you see a lot more of that collaboration, but I, I totally agree and I, I that, that we don't do a good job in telehealth leadership at the national level. I'm pretty sure that goes back to 1998, and we probably need to get over that and, and be more collaborative in that. So one more question, and then we're going to close. Uh, I'm Bill Applegate with the Iowa Chronic Care Consortium, and I wouldn't want to end on anything but a rebel-rousing note. So here you go. <clears throat> I, am, um, I am really uh, appreciative of all three of these organizations and am member and a member of them. I want you to know that. And I've been involved in them in nominal ways over the past few years. I also know something else, and that is that you respond to what your members want in a great, a great deal. And I, I want to sympathize a little bit with Alan, for example, knowing who many of his members are when I ask this question, okay? And this is primarily for Alan, and, um, and I think I, I, maybe, I think for Alan and, and, and maybe for George, Dr. Benjamin a little bit, but I won't let Stuart off the hook entirely. Okay, so here goes. <laughs> Tell me why the world of healthcare now is so focused because the money is there in chronic disease and managing chronic disease that the National Rural Health Association, the Amer American Public Health Association, isn't more aggressive, demonstrative, and leader-like in addressing those particular issues. And I don't want to be terribly critical, but I do think it's like that's where the money is, that's where the opportunity is. And when I look at meeting schedules or meeting uh, uh, events that you have and things like that, I am impressed or curious, I'm not sure, at how bereft they are of lots of attention to managing chronic disease in this country. Well, thank you, Bill, for that softball question to <laughs> close this agenda with. Well, I will say, I, I think the, the question begs a, a much larger question. And I won't speak for the other associations, but at the National Rural Health Association, we ask our 21,000 members for submissions for our conferences to set our educational content. And then out of the 200-some submissions we get, we have a planning committee of, say, 25 uh, uh, members that, that select that agenda. And I have to be honest with you, the submissions just haven't been there. And that's not an excuse, but it raises a larger issue of where, as you said, from a membership perspective, where is the focus at? And what is, what, what is the attention put on on a daily focus for the people that are involved in delivering or receiving rural health care? Yeah, I think we've decided that, that the solution to this problem is through um, not only primary prevention but pre-primary prevention so that looking at things like the built environment, um, food systems, um, um, trying to tra the way we build transportation systems, um, and, and looking at what we view, are, of course, as social determinants of health. So we've spent, been spending a fair amount of money and time and effort in doing that. So if one steps back through the Affordable Care Act, um, we were certainly very much involved in all the all the clinical prevent, preventive health services and those kinds of things. We certainly supported all that, um, but we were big advocates for the fifteen billion dollar prevention fund, um, and that is very targeted to physical inactivity, nutrition, and tobacco. Um, and if you actually look at the leading causes of death and disability, um, you know cardiovascular disease, cancer, um, some injuries. Um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and, and you know, pneumonia, um, you know, it comes back to tobacco, tobacco, tobacco. And then once you get past that one, it's, it's uh, um, a, a range of nutrition, physical inactivity, and um, as, as root causes. And so we have been very, very focused on trying to um, engage this. And we've, we've recognized that we're pushing a big rock up a hill. Um, so we're spending a lot of time trying to get the public to embrace that change and and in fact the prevention fund is 
designed to engage communities um, to try to get systems changed. But we've recognized until, you know, my grandmother and your uncle and your daughter run up to the legislature and tell them we want change on this, um, it's not going to change. I mean, they know exactly, they know exactly what I'm going to say. They probably know exactly what you're going to say. But when, they, when we get that unanticipated messenger coming up, someone from the utility company or someone from the grocery store, the, you know, the, the, the CEO coming up and telling them, we've got to have community, we've got to have fundamental change here from a broader health perspective if we're, if we're serious about getting our costs down. Um, we've argued for some time that the, the, the cheapest way to get down Medicare costs is not to put sick people into Medicare. And the best way to not do that is to, you know, give people a healthier lifestyle from the beginning. Um, and, um, and so we've worked very hard to try to try to change those perspectives. Uh, as you may know, um, there has been a, an, an enormous assault on the Public Health and Prevention Fund. There's been an enormous assault to CDC and its funding. Um, and so we've been very focused, uh, frankly, uh, in that battle to try to preserve the core funding and infrastructure for public health that we have now in addition to the additional dollars we got from the, the Affordable Care Act. So that, that's kind of where we've been spending a lot of our time and effort. And then, of course, we've been supporting, you know, chronic diseases through a variety of other efforts, both on the, uh, on the international front and, um, you know, and locally. I thought you were going to let me off the hook. Yeah, um, it was just a hooker there. I had to bring uh, you in. I didn't want you to feel left out. So, so, so you know, f from a market perspective, home telehealth remote patient monitoring has been the largest growing segment of telehealth. It's the largest growing part of the industry. Okay. And uh, ATA is, is kind of a mixed association, but it does have a fairly large industry component. So it gets fairly well represented in, in the conference and the meetings. Of course, we're working in standards and guidelines. And... Um, so I think ATA recognizes this and is doing everything within their scope to be involved in this. Um, could I return to the comment you made about these organizations being responsive to members mm -hmm. for one moment? I'd just like to let Paul the dentist know that um, oral health is now on the website. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you want to finish on a high note. <laughs> That's good. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, let's thank all of our speakers on this panel. Um, would the planning committee please come to the stage? Um, our next session is a uh, planning committee concluding remarks and open discussion. Uh, led by Dr. Ruben.